All right, everyone. Welcome to the lookout. Uh, today's uh, Monday, the 22nd, and there's a new fire burning in Plumas County. There's a couple fires that are really um, going for it. Um, I was just up, you know, within four or five miles of this fire yesterday. Uh, I spent the weekend up in uh, Gray Eagle, and it was hot and dry. And then we had thunderstorms that kind of came through nearby and big outflow winds. Um, really dramatic kind of summertime weather. Anyway, I'm going to jump in and show you where they are, and then we're going to kind of look at some potential and some maps. The mill fire looks like it's really ripping. So um, let's just kind of jump right in here. And uh, I'd like to say, if you're up there and you're watching this, if you live in Gold Mountain or um, Nakoma or Iron Horse, um, you might want to go pack your stuff instead of watching me tell you what's going on because it looks like it's really moving. Um, and you can tell more going outside probably. Um, if the wind is blowing towards you and you smell smoke and taste ash, it's a good time to pack up and go. All right, so for a quick orientation here, um, we got two fires. Um, the mill fire looks like it's two different fires that are kind of growing near each other. And we got the Smith Fire, which is kind of north and a little west of Deliker. So here's Portola. Here's Blairsden, Gray Eagle, Clio, and Whitehawk. <coughs> so the Mill Fire is the one that's really ripping right now. And so it's on the hill above Whitehawk. And kind of the most immediate concern I've got is Gold Mountain here, Nakoma. All these yellow dots out here uh, show you kind of where the community of Gold Mountain is. And then along this um, county road, A15 corridor up to Iron Horse, there's a lot of homes in there. And the fire is kind of burning upslope here. This is a view kind of looking from Portola back towards the mill fire. And uh, just look at the last hour here. So they're going to manage these two fires as a single uh, fire, basically. I'm not sure exactly how far apart they are. Another view of it is from, uh, this is from Beckworth Peak. <coughs> and so there's a spot here. Um, so this is on the northeast side of the mountain. So the fire had spotted over early on, or was a separate lightning ignition. And let's see another view here from the Sierra Buttes. But what we're seeing basically with the column is just that the slope and fuels are aligned along with the light prevailing wind. And that's really, you know, Things are critically dry. This is what we call capping out here. It means it, it's what uh, whether people like to nerd out and call it a pyro Q or a pyro uh, CN, cumulonimbus. But that just tells you that there's it's punched up into the upper atmosphere and this is all the moisture. So this has officially got a column on it. And um, this fire over here is the one that's on Smith Peak near Portola. So um, we're just watching the mill fire and. When we saw that it had spotted on the back side of the ridge, I'm um, not clear exactly where that is, if that's up here. And then Beckworth Peak number two is looking over at the fire, um, the Smith fire. So down here is Deliker. This is burning. Um, you can tell that you've got a, a pretty good prevailing wind up Canyon here, which is super normal. And let's look at the last hour of that. You can see some spots taking off out here ahead of it. So that's that spot there. So the whole deal um, about fires that we have in this um, fuel type in this landscape is that, you know, being out there the other day is 
this time of year it's incredibly hot and dry and you've got grass and pine needles that are highly, highly, highly susceptible to embers and starting new fires. So these, both these fires, I just want to give a little kind of regional kind of context here, is we're sitting at the headwaters of the Middle Fork Feather River. And so Sierra Valley is kind of the headwaters here of the Middle Fork. And the Middle Fork drains all the way down to Lake Orville. So here's Quincy. Uh, the Middle Fork kind of drains down through down through here. Down at the bottom we've got Lake Orville, and we've got uh, Bald Rock Dome, and, and we've got Millsap Bar and Hartman Bar and the Middle Fork. And so in the afternoon you got winds that blow up these canyons every day. And they funnel up through here and you're still here in the Middle Fork. And so when you see these winds that are blowing on the Smith Fire in this direction, that's just kind of the, the breathing of the, the valley air coming up the canyon like it does every day and blowing out towards the desert. Um, and you've got that same effect here on the mill fire where it's coming up kind of over Gray Eagle and blowing up towards Whitehawk. So just real typical afternoon winds going up the canyons here. So that's why this fire here um, is really ripping is that it's got fuel ahead of it, it's got light flashy fuels, all this grass is just perfect for the fire to spot and hop, skip and jump, right? And then you've got the topography funneling it. So it's going to keep going this way out towards the desert. There's not strong winds there right now showing on the weather stations, but it's just this is a prime landscape for rapid fire spread. And so if you look at the kind of fire history of here, um, the fire history tells that same story. You've got these fires that, um, like this fire here that started down by Clio in uh, 1959. It burned um, with the Up Canyon and then usually they get put out within a day or so. You know, in the past, you'd have a fire like this and it would burn for a day or two and then we'd have a bunch of hotshot crews and everything else. Um, but you see this, this pattern, this linearity, this fire that burned right through kind of the edge of Portola here in um, 1949, right? They all kind of tell the same story. They're kind of squiggly, they run up the hill, usually for one or two days. And you really see that going along the Highway 70 corridor. You've got all these fires that ran to the top of the ridge and then we put them out. So the Greenhorn Fire of 1990, the Slope Fire of 81, uh, unnamed fire from 1929, the Lehman Fire. And you can see the scars of these still uh, in the form of brush fields and everything else. But that's, that's your, every place has kind of a fire story and that's the story of the Highway 70 corridor is fires that start on the bottom of the slope and run uphill for you know one burning period. They run out of slope and they put, we put them out because we have hotshot crews and every, all these other resources. Now the more modern version of that is you've got like the North Complex that burned 300,000 acres or the Dixie Fire that burned. Um, and what these big fires are doing now are kind of compartmentalizing the landscape. So the Smith Fire you know, it might burn, uh, it likely won't, but it, its potential to be a mega fire is limited by the fact that this all burned in Dixie. It doesn't mean that fires can't spread in the Dixie fire scar, but they have a lot less fuel than they did a few years ago. Anyway, that's kind of, um, these, these things tell you the story. So like when we did our um, community defense kind of plan for Nakoma, we told them, hey, your scenario is a fire that's going to burn up the canyon here. Maybe it'll be started by a train, but it's going to burn through your community. So as far as worst case scenario, this fire is a pretty bad story for Nakoma Gold Mountain, but it would be worse if it started over here because it would already be through the community. So the fire is going to be getting into there, but it's going to be not necessarily a headshot straight into Gold Mountain.
There's an app called Radar Scope. Let's see, Reno Radar. So it's showing the cloud here. Um, you can see the lightning storm here and the strikes. And then you can see the fire building. You can see that there's some uh, precipitation with this storm. Like, um, but this is showing actually precipitation from the column and I don't think that's happening. This uh, green here you're seeing is kind of the, the ice cap on the column. And this um, the fire is showing up here on um, the satellite animation. So <clears throat> whenever you see this kind of like bright red, yellow kind of color, it means that you've got super significant fire activity. Now sometimes early in a fire, this is the best we get as far as our heat satellites and everything else. But I'm hoping that the Firus plane, uh, which is state resource, will fly over this thing and we'll get a little better look at where it is. This is uh, kind of a, a structure map where people live. So, so our fire's down in here right now. Okay, this is another good site for uh, doing the stuff we do. Flight Radar 24. Uh, this is the spotter plane. They were orbiting the mill fire here and then they start to, when you see they start to take going farther out and farther out, that tells you something about the extent of the fire. So right now the air attack's headed back and you've got these tankers here that are headed back to Grass Valley. And you've got some other tankers headed that way from, um, well you've got an Intel ship and you've got a Type 1 helicopter. This Intel 12 is the plane that's gonna come fly the fire. All right, back to the cameras. One thing is that once this fire kind of runs out of slope, it'll have less energy uh, to work with it won't spread as fast downhill as it is spreading uphill. So we're kind of seeing, like, for now, um, we're kind of seeing the worst um, case scenario, which is fire moving uphill with um, slope and wind in its favor. This column's really pulsing. Oftentimes that kind of happens. Um, the column's held aloft by the heat of the fire burning. And so when the fire kind of abruptly runs out of gas or burns a bunch of timber and then it hits a kind of open patch, the fire can, the column can kind of pulse. And in extreme cases, the, fi the column can collapse. You know, if, you, if a fire burns to the top of the ridge with a bunch of steam on it, and then it runs out of fuel to keep all this, there's millions of pounds of carbon and water vapor and uh, everything else, particulate matter basically, held aloft by the heat of the fire, of the convection rising. And so if that suddenly, if you suddenly lose all that lift, this thing can come crashing down. And when that does, it can break off, you know, 24 inch trees and blow the fire all over the place. It's a, it's a dangerous circumstance. The mill fire, um, it's kind of, there's a kind of patchwork here of private and uh, public ownership. So this is Plumas National Forest is in green. And uh, Gray Eagle, Gray Eagle Land and Water owns these patches where the fire started. I just learned about this. Um, I was just in Gray Eagle, Gray Eagle. And it turns out, Gregel's kind of similar to where I grew up in some ways in that, like the town I'm from, Westwood, where this was all timberland, and then they had a mill in Gray Eagle. And then when the wood was all cut, and it was also like Westwood, where they were cutting down trees to make fruit boxes. And then we invented cardboard, and the demand for fruit boxes uh, went way down. So they had all this land, they closed the mill, and some people bought all this land and the town, and then they started kind of this uh, this resort. They got subdivision plans here to do some more. Uh, built the golf course, everything else, and they still own a lot of this. So 
they own also this land where the fire started. And there's all this talk about um, forest management and um, the Forest Service not having their act together. And it's not just the Forest Service. Managing f cut over timber land for fire resilience is uh, it's expensive, it's uh, a lot of work, it's kind of perpetual. So I just was over here in Grey Eagle and then drove Highway 70 back through Quincy and everything. And it's terrible, the, the woods are so sick everywhere. It's so thick, so fire deprived. Um, I often feel like, you know, I was talking to my kids about it. We were up on Sierra Buttes and we were looking out at this very landscape. And I was thinking like, man, I sure hope you guys still have some forest to look at when your kids are your age. Because having grown up in Westwood and watching the Dixie Fire burn it all, I look at this landscape and I have a feeling we're gonna lose it all. Uh, just, just knowing what it takes to manage forests and how unlikely it is that we're gonna put prescribed fire on the ground here at scale. Like I'm not at all help, hopeful that we're not gonna burn this all up. Uh, I've got a job right now to kind of look at Plumas County uh, urban interface and try to help design projects to protect the communities. But it's just, it's so daunting to look at these landscapes that are so out of whack, that have been so kind of worked over for the last 150 years uh, and to know how much money it's going to take and what kind of will it's going to take. And um, it's heavy. It's heavy. Um, watching it happen in real time is, uh, is, it's a strange time we live in. But back to the physics of it, this fire here, these historic fires, this one from 37, the landscape's the same. This landscape's been hammered in the past. There's been, these fires that burned in 37 probably ripped and logging slashed from them cutting down all the original old growth. That just gives you, you know, what we run into with a fire like this is you've got this window of time where the fire started at 3 p.m and it's gonna rip till the sun goes down. And so what's it gonna do in that time? You're gonna get five hours of what we call the active burning period. And so these old fire scars kind of show you that potential, like, okay, this might be what happens when a fire runs uncontrolled for five hours. Because after that, sun went down, fire behavior really changes often when the sun goes down. So as long as the sun's up, the wind's blowing, and it's hot, this fire's gonna it's gonna march long and then it's gonna, um, tonight, it's gonna be backing down the mountains. Um, you'll see it, um, you know, in the morning, it's gonna be all smoked out around here. You won't see it very well. It's gonna be hard for air attack to really figure out what's going on. And that's the pattern we get. Then in the afternoon tomorrow, the wind's gonna blow again, smoke's gonna clear out. Uh, you might have more thunderstorms. And what's dangerous right now about um, kind of what we call the convective activity is that um, we get what's called outflow winds. So I'm just gonna see real quick if here on radar scope. Oftentimes you get a big storm and you can see the, we talked about columns collapsing and and what happens when the storm uh, kind of falls apart All that weight of the um, storm it kind of um, get what's called outflow winds and you can kind of see them here like These lines of blue those are pushing out from storms that have kind of fallen apart and What's dangerous about outflow winds is that they're strong and they travel for Sometimes you know tens of miles and so if this fire is still burning tomorrow and we have another thunderstorm that comes through here, um, the outflow winds of a, f you can have a storm that's 20 miles away, but the outflow winds can, they, sh they can sheet out across the landscape and they can really do crazy things to your fire behavior. So just in kind of the tea leaves here of what we're gonna, I think, see happen is fire's gonna kind of lay down a bit tonight. It'll be backing, it'll, it's gonna run the slope this afternoon um, everything that's available to this fire upslope of it um, is likely going to have fire on it. So this area here um, tonight, by the time the sun goes down, the fire is going to be kind of at the top of the hill and backing down the other sides. And that will take a lot of the, the force out of it. Overnight, it'll probably um, be a little more subdued. 
in the morning will be smoky tomorrow afternoon the smoke will come off fire will stand up again um, a lot of it depends on what what the winds are doing so what the fire bosses are looking for is like where can they make access where can they get in there and fight it tonight where the where can they get in there and fight it tomorrow night uh, but they have to kind of have a strategy that anticipates tomorrow afternoon's fire behavior. Um, and maybe they, tonight, um, can catch the heel of this thing, um, downhill of where it's burning, where it's backing. Maybe they can get crews on that tonight and catch it. But what we end up doing oftentimes is, um, you know, we, we start at the heel of the fire and we work our way around. You can't really fight the head when it's really active. So they'll be working the heels and the flanks, and that's often what the air tankers are doing as well, is they're working where they've got the opportunity to be effective. Eventually, hopefully, the conditions subside, the fire runs out of slope, and then you can attack the head directly. But as long as the fire is really spotting and moving, you can't really fight the head. Air tankers, um, we use them to cool down the fire. We use them to kind of knock the fire down enough to buy time that you can engage troops a little farther out, but like we said, this is just such a perfect landscape for spot-driven fires. Fire burns up the slope, throws spots out here. Those spots burn up this slope, they throw spots out here. You get this real hopscotch effect. And that's one of the things that's really kind of cool about these new Intel planes is that we're getting kind of real-time infrared showing how that progresses. In the past, we get infrared once in the middle of the night, then we don't get it again for 24 hours. So speaking of that, let's just kind of jump in and see where our Intel plane is at. Here's the Intel plane that's coming in, coming in hot. One thing that's been helping a lot on these fires has been um, night helicopter operations. Like we said, nighttime often the fires kind of lay down and uh, helicopters flying at night have been pretty much a game changer in some of our recent fires. You have to take the opportunity you can to engage the fire when it's not um, super active. Last 30 minutes of the Smith fire. So the air tax got just a, a really remarkable job in that they have to decide where they're going to be most effective. Uh, they've got these two fires going. They're also um, competing for resources on kind of a, a regional scale. And so they have to make their case uh, of why they should get priority. That's really remarkable. So interesting here, you know, um, look at this at the big scale. So you got winds blowing up the canyon at the surface, fanning this thing, but then you've got transport winds that are blowing back to the west. Does anyone want to explain that? I've been seeing them, you know, on Twitter, there's a lot of people that are um, talking about pyrocumulus and pyrocumulonimbus clouds, and they they're using satellite data to um, look at how many of them we have and saying that there's more of them. I don't know, you know, like I've been working on fires for um, 30 years and I've seen a lot of columns. And it seems to be like when a fire pops up a column now, people think that it's kind of like a tornado or something. The rare or kind of uh, uncommon. And I'd say, you know, in my career, I've seen hundreds of columns. It's not, uh, it just, it's something that happens when you have a timber fire running, making a slope driven run. And so I'm curious, you know, if you're a researcher doing that work, um, your take on that, like, is this, um, what's different? Am I, am I missing something? Um, it's a column, timber fires put up columns. Um, is it something different than it has before? Um, educate me. Here's a bigger tanker coming in. And this thing came all the way up from uh, Lancaster. Tankers are great in the first, you know, little while, first bit of the fire. And once the fire is kind of up and running and doing this, uh, 
like we said, it might help out on the flanks a little, but um, I don't know, man. I'm not gonna put the fire out. Let's look at this one again. See what our fire's doing on the back side. So we talked about how fires um, often spread slower downhill. But not all is the case. You know, I've seen fires run crown fire downhill, and what's happening here is the fire is uh, spotting, right? So you can see in this hour time lapse, there's spots down here ahead of the fire, and then they're burning back in. And so that that big updraft from the column is creating these local strong winds that suck the spots back in to itself. But this this view here just really shows that. Um, spotting as a major mechanism of fire spread. When the fire made its run up to the top of the mountain, it's throwing embers. The stuff going up, torching up in the column here, and then and you can you can just see kind of how this would be throwing stuff out ahead of itself and then sucking it back in. Scott Chadwick says, homes in line east of Beck with Peak with resources on site, tank, pump, etc. How to let local firefighters know um, get a sheet of plywood or something you can paint on and put it out on the road. Um, the universal kind of sign for uh, water source is um, this. So spray paint, uh, make a sign of something, even if you, you know, whatever you can. Signs are good. Um, flag off, um, you know, if, if there's a driveway that doesn't go to your stuff, um, you know, if you want them to come up, if you don't want them to go, you know, to the wrong spot, um, it, you can take flagging and put it across, you know, a dead end road or something else. One thing that's really important when there's a fire burning near where you live is um, to leave a note or a sign um, of what your priorities are. Um, we work a bit in like Sonoma County and there might be a million dollar house um, and the firefighters will come protect that, but the vineyard that's got the 50 year old Zinfandel, um, that might be worth $10 million. And so oftentimes the, the wine growers would rather have you go save the vineyard because you can get insurance on your house and you can rebuild your house, but you can't rebuild 50 year old vines. So if you've got a property and you've got several different buildings, uh, you should always, Try to find a way that you can leave a note for your priority. Uh, maybe spray paint. Maybe if you got a shed that is not a real priority, or a shed even that you don't even really like having anymore, just paint on it. Don't save um, or low priority, and then they can focus their resources on what's really important to you. Jane says, "Do you think fires will get increasingly worse due to anthropogenic climate change, or are the apocalyptic climate claims alarmist?" I think both. You know, talking to firefighters and just being um, someone who's lived in this landscape for 30 years. Um, minor things make a big difference. So like in the past we had lower nighttime temperatures. And so even just a couple degrees different temperature in um, the middle of the night can make a difference between whether your fire is torching and spotting or whether you can walk right up to it and put it out with a shovel. And so the fire behavior that we've seen in the last uh, 10 years on these big catastrophic timber fires. It can be hard to parse out the effect of climate change from the effect of land management history. Um, you know, all these landscapes that we're burning right now used to have ginormous, well-spaced ponderosa pine trees with five inch thick bark. And we don't have that much of that anymore. And then where we do have the big old trees, we've got thickets of white fir uh, from fire suppression. So it's all, climate change is definitely affecting how we fight fires, how fires behave, but it's all tied together. The, the forest management history, the lack of management on a lot of land, uh, the past management. Okay, so they flew it. Okay, two different fires, lightning, I'm thinking, that's what it seems like. Here's uh, White Hawk down here. Fire blasted up, jumped over the ridge, spotted out in here. This fire, 
uh, is going to do the same thing, likely, but um, might get lucky. The sun might go down before it hits the ridge and spots all over the place. Um, so right now it's burning away from Nakoma and Gold Mountain. Um, doesn't mean it's going to stay there, but so far so good. This fire spread almost three miles in the first three hours. And here, a uh, mile, a little over a mile. So, you know, when we look at that um, fire history, it's interesting, you know, you can just kind of take this fire and move it all over the landscape, and that's your potential. That's what's happened in the past, that's what's gonna happen in the future. And it just helps you kind of, if you wanna game out scenarios for a fire in an area, it helps you to go and look at what's happened in the past and to understand, hey, in one active three hour, four hour window of burning, this is what a fire does, and then we put it out. But this, this whole thing about, um, you know, insurance companies um, backing out of high risk markets, et cetera, it's like, those folks aren't dumb. The folks that are like making those calls on whether or not your house is insurable, like it's heartless. Um, and it, it really sucks if you can't get insurance, but there's a reason in a lot of cases that someone's not gonna take that risk. And that's because these things here that are happening are just part of the, they're, they're part of this landscape. And if you look at the fire history, um, you know, this area's had fires like this exact same scenario for as long as we've been making maps of it. You know, you look at the fire history map of the state and uh, you know, this is just this area here. You go up around Susanville, um, same thing. You see this like history of short little wind-driven fires burning from the southwest to the northeast. Sometimes they're big, oftentimes they're not. Oftentimes they just run up a hill and go out. But this is, you know, um, what we see a lot of is, um, you know, Gavin Newsom doing a press release on all the expenditures that they're making to increase fire response. And there's no doubt about it, like all these new helicopters that cost you know, uh, a huge amount of money, like they are effective. They help you put out fires. But then you get a fire like this that's in alignment and it doesn't matter how many helitankers you have in that first, you know, operating in that first amount of time. There's not a lot of other fires going on right now in California, but we don't have the resources to stop a fire that is your typical fire that escapes initial attack. Lightning comes through, three new starts, you're gonna get a run. And if your house is in that run, you're gonna lose your home. It doesn't matter if we've got, you know, if we spent a hundred times as much on fire suppression, we can't stop a fire like, um, like this one. We will stop it. And it might stop it pretty quick um, if the weather cooperates. But this initial run is kind of the, you just hope that this initial run is not lined up with your homestead. there's these limits to um, our ability overall to work at the scale of wildfire, to, to deal with it as, you know, as the force that it is. When you are talking about thinning and then you look at, you know, uh, that, like, there's this incompa incompatibility of scales between kind of human effort and natural disaster. Laurie says, do we have a replacement for the global super tanker? Was it a big loss for California? Uh, Cal Fire's got a bunch of C-130s they're breaking out. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the giant super tankers. They are good at um, dumping a lot of mud, but it wouldn't have stopped this fire. So they're limited in utility. They often, they're kind of performative. Um, they're effective in grass and sage and everything else, but like we dumped gazillion 
loads of retardant on the Dixie fire and it still spread for two months until the weather changed. Cool folks, I'm gonna jump off. Uh, thanks for your support. Check out thelookout.org and uh, we'll be back on in the morning to see what happened.